to see everybody in this afternoon and uh, we've uh, been privileged to meet several new folks that haven't been here before. We've got three ladies from Texas. We've got a gentleman back there from Roanoke, Virginia. Got a young lady here. I guess you're in the Oklahoma area though, aren't you? But she hasn't been here before. And uh, I think all the rest of them, as far as I can tell. Let's see, we got a gentleman right here, right. And uh, he's here for the first time. And uh, I don't like to miss anybody. And then for those of you joining us in television, again, we'd just like to welcome you to an informal Bible study. I think most of you know by now that we don't attack anybody. We don't try to lift ourselves up as having all the answers. But we just simply try to search out the truth and see what the Bible really says and uh, let it speak for itself. Uh, hopefully, whenever I give out my own idea, I will make that plain, that this is what I think. Other than that, we try to stay strictly by what the Word of God says. So, uh, for those of you out in television, we just like to take this opportunity to thank you again for your prayers, for your letters, and of course for your financial support. Now, I just about forgot, honey, but uh, we've got a listener out in uh, Indiana who, uh, through a tragic experience of losing a beautiful young little wife, 26 years old, and uh, through it, he was, of course, devastated. And uh, through all the turmoil, he found our program and came into a real walk with the Lord. And he's just become an avid Bible student. He calls periodically with questions. But anyway, uh, almost unbeknown to us, I remember now, a couple of years ago, he asked if he could do this. And I said, yeah, go ahead. So anyway, using our material from off the Internet and the program and so forth, he has put together a book of... 88 questions, I think it is, and the answers, of course, are all taken from our, uh, our program material, and he has just done a fabulous job. I, I couldn't believe it when I saw it, and uh, I wasn't even really aware of it until we were at one of our seminars out east, and a young man came up, and he had taken this off of the Internet. It's also up on the Internet, and uh, everything of ours is up there, and you can download it without cost, but... Uh, this guy was just really exercising. He said, do you know what this is? No, no not really. So uh, after seeing it, we decided that we have to make this available to our whole listening audience. And we're going to uh, mail them out with just what they cost us. I offered Paul a buck a book for his effort, and he didn't want that. So we'll send them out for just exactly what they cost us. And uh, we'll charge for the postage, but not for the packaging and the handling. We'll handle that. And I guess it's going to be 11 bucks. And that what the girls decided now with the postage going up. They thought first we could do it for 10, but uh, we'd be losing too much. And so we're going to make them available for $11. And I can really highly recommend it because hopefully this will drop a lot of the questions that come in the mail <laughs> because they're all in here. Every question that I've ever even confronted, he, he's got pretty much covered. And uh, we just praise the Lord for Paul. We finally got him to agree to put his own testimony on the back side. And uh, ours is on the inside cover. But uh, we want to give him all the credit because I know he has put a lot of time into this. So uh, call in or write in and uh, we'll get them out to you. We still haven't received our, our major order, so for those of you in the studio, don't try to pick one up yet today. We've only got just a sample copy. Okay, now, this is a Bible study, and I'm always reminded of that. They say don't take even two minutes for announcements. We want the whole 28 minutes in Bible study. So here we go. Hebrews, chapter 10. And we're still in verse 1. The whole last half hour was only in the first statement of Hebrews 10.1. So we'll just come back to it for a moment. And again, for background, remember it is written primarily to the Jewish people. It's written to the Hebrews. And so the whole thing is naturally flavored in that direction. Although the overall doctrines, you can go right back into Romans and uh, Galatians and Ephesians and pick up almost the same thing. But never forget that these things are written to Jewish people who are having a hard time turning their back on all the traditions and the teachings of Judaism. And it's no different than someone coming out of a cult. My, it is so hard to turn their back on something that's been pounded into them for a lifetime and then suddenly realize that 
it's no longer the right way. And so Paul is addressing these admonitions to Jews who were understanding to a point his gospel of grace, but they still had to be convinced that all of this was part and parcel of God's program for the ages, as I like to call it. And uh, we're going to go back to some of the things in Romans in just a moment. But read chapter 10, verse 1, before we do that, where he writes for the law, the law. The Old Testament economy. Now, usually we think of the Ten Commandments as the law. But you can't confine it always to just the Ten because, you see, because of the Ten Commandments, God instituted the temple worship, or what we call the ceremonial aspect of the law. In other words, if they committed a particular sin, they had to bring a particular sacrifice. But naturally, basic to all of it was the moral law, the Ten Commandments. All right, so the law, having a shadow of good things to come. Not necessarily good while it was in practice, but looking forward to something that was good in the future. And not the very image of the things, and can never with those sacrifices, which they offered year by year, continually make the comers thereunto perfect. Now, in plain English, what's he saying? All of this practice of the law could never bring that Jew to a full relationship with God. It was impossible because they were still under a system of animal sacrifices and uh, everything was merely a shadow of that which was to come. Now, I think I pointed out in our last program, even though for us here it was a month ago, it's been a long month, honey and I decided because, my, since last taping, you know, we've been out Ohio and Indiana and been up to northwest Kansas and uh, we've just covered the territory since the last taping. So that seems like a long time ago, but uh, it isn't, just a month ago. And so for those watching the program daily, the day will come when bing bing it just goes from one day to the next but nevertheless for those of us in here this month seems like a long time ago when we covered the difference between the image and the shadow and I'm going to repeat it because I think it bears repeating remember I gave the illustration of this gentleman who had a big beautiful tree and his best friend was a woodworker and so that friend could just see that beautiful tree down and saw it into lumber that he could use for whatever he was going to make. And so he asked his friend what he would take for that tree. Well, of course, he wanted several hundred dollars. Oh, he says, there's no way I can pay you that kind of money. He says, I'll sell you the shadow for 15. <laughs> well, you know, we smile, but the lesson is the shadow is the exact outline of that tree, but that's all it is. You cannot determine what kind of a tree it is. You can't see the shape of the leaves. You can't see the configurations in the bark. All you see is the outline. The tree, you can go up to it and you can examine and you know exactly what it is and so forth. All right, now that's the analogy throughout Hebrews, that all these things back under the law were not the tree, they were the shadow. But if you start at the far end of the shadow and you follow it, where does it take you? To the tree. Oh, now that's the whole idea of the Old Testament economy. It's just like the shadow of a tree that as you follow it, it's going to bring you to the image or the real thing. Now the word image here in Hebrew, the book of Hebrews, in the Greek is the same Greek word that when the disciples were confronting Jesus about uh, materialistic things. He asked them for a denarius, a Roman coin. And what did he ask them? Whose image is on that coin? What was their answer? Well, Caesar's. All right, now that word image is the same word translated image here in Hebrews. Now, when they looked at a Roman coin, what did they see? They saw the likeness of Caesar. That was the image. All right, now this is what we're supposed to understand, that all these Old Testament things, everything that took place under the law, were just the shadow of the real thing. 
And what's the real thing? Christ, death, burial, resurrection, ascension to glory. See the difference? Okay, so now then, the Old Testament economy, it was good while it was there. But it was only a shadow looking forward to something which would be, as we've seen throughout all these previous nine chapters, something far better. Remember that? Over and over we've seen that. Yes, that was good, but this is better. All right. Let's go back to Romans. <clears throat> Chapter 3. Been a long time. Well, I guess the daily program is in Romans right now, but... Uh, by the time this program gets on the air, it'll be long gone. So let's go back to Romans chapter 3, where the same apostle writes now, and not in the language that pertained to the Jew, but in language that pertained to the non-Jew. And that's why he's always emphasizing that he was the apostle of the Gentiles. But he's basically saying the same thing, only he's approaching two different kinds of of people. <clears throat> Romans 3, let's look at verse 19 and 20. Romans 3, 19 and 20. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law. Well, I don't think there's a person in this room that doesn't know who was under the law. Israel. Israel was under the law, not the Gentile world. Only Israel practiced the temple worship and the sacrifices and had the priesthood. All right, but so far as the power of the law to condemn, it didn't stop at the borders of Israel. It went to the whole human race, to every last human being that's ever lived. The law condemns. All right, read on. So it said to them who were under the law, but that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Now, you know, I, I repeat and I repeat and I repeat. And over and over, people say, keep repeating. So I'm not going to apologize for that. But again, how many people, even right here in the Bible Belt, have got that fouled up idea that the Ten Commandments are somehow a means of gaining entrance into heaven. They're just the opposite. They're God's reason for not letting a human being into his heaven because they're all guilty. And that's all the law could do was show men their guilt. And this verse says it as plain as day, see, that all the world may become guilty, not saved, not made ready for heaven, but made guilty. Verse 20, therefore, since that was the purpose of the law, to condemn mankind, therefore, by the deeds or the keeping of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, Jew or Gentile, nobody. And then he repeats the reason. For the law is the knowledge of, not salvation or eternal life, but what? Sin. That's all the law can do is show us our sin. Every time you read the Ten Commandments, all they can do is just bombard you with what? You're guilty. You're guilty. There's not a one of us that can say, I'm not guilty. And then the Lord himself even really made it tough. If you think it in your heart, you're what? You're guilty. James says if you're guilty of one, you're guilty of how many? All of them. I mean, we don't stand a chance. That's how condemning the Ten Commandments are. But in verse 21, what's the first word? One of my favorite words in Scripture. But, B-U-T, see? Oh, yeah, that's all the law could do was condemn. But there's a tremendous, a tremendous loophole, big enough for the whole world to come through if they would. And what is it? That now the righteousness of God without the law. See? Now we're coming to the end of the shadow. We're coming to the image. We're coming to the real thing. But now the righteousness of God 
without the law is manifested, just brought into full flower, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Now, whenever somebody accuses me, and they do occasionally, of being too Pauline, you make too much of Paul. Paul isn't the only one that knows any of these things. I said he never claimed to. Look what he says right here. Everything that he is being revealed is resting on that which went before. And what went before the Apostle Paul? The law and the prophets. He never claims to have just come out of the woodwork with all this. His is just part of what I've always called progressive revelation. From Genesis 1.1, this blessed book is a progressive revelation. You don't get it all up there in the first chapter. It just keeps flowing. And as it gets, just like old Mississippi, there, you know, up there in Minnesota, you can walk across it on a few stones. But my, by the time it gets to the Gulf of Mexico, you need a ship to go across it. Well, that's the way the progressive revelation of Scripture is. It just keeps expanding and expanding and expanding. And that's why we can't plumb the depths of it. But Paul claims by inspiration that everything he's had revealed to him is resting on the law and the prophets. Through the Old Testament economy, Christ came. In his first advent, presented himself to the nation of Israel for three years but rejected, crucified, in order to become the supreme sacrifice that the law, again, was just a shadow of. See? All right, now then, coming on a little further in Romans. So after being witnessed by the law and the prophets, this is now evident that the righteousness of God, not man's righteousness, but God's righteousness, is now made available by the faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that, what? Believe. And that's another pill that's hard for some people to swallow. That all of this is appropriated on our behalf when we believe plus nothing. I got a letter in the mail yesterday. I haven't had time to read it all. All I saw was the first sentence. Last year, wrong. There's more than faith plus nothing. Well, then I can just wait and I'll read that when I got nothing better to do. <laughs> because it is faith plus nothing. I don't care what any person says. Because over and over, the scriptures make it so plain that this is where it's at. It isn't faith plus. It's belief. 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 And we did that in our seminar out in Ohio a few weeks ago. One of the questions toward the middle of the afternoon was, is water baptism necessary for salvation? Boy, you know how that triggers me. And so I just went back, and I didn't say a word from my own thinking. I just went scripture after scripture after scripture after scripture. And fortunately, I think with the Holy Spirit's help, I was able to show all these verses, like this one right here. Look at it again. This is one that I used, and I'll show you how I did it. For it is by the faithfulness of Jesus Christ unto all them that believe and are baptized. Well, I had 400 and some people raise their head and shake it. No, that's not what it says. And then you can go back to Romans 1.16. What does Paul say? For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it, the gospel, is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth and is baptized. Is that what it says? No. That's not what it says. To everyone that what? Believeth. Period. And so I went all the way through Paul's epistles where it says to him that believeth. Plus nothing. See? All right, so here it is. All them that believe with no strings attached. And then, of course, there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. Oh, my goodness. I could just exhaust some more. But let's go back to Hebrews, or we never will get out of that book, will we? Back to Hebrews 10. So let's move on through the last half of the verse now. This whole system of the law, which was only the shadow, with all of its works, feast days, the sacrifices, 
continuously, never ending. And then what does the verse say? And those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually never, never make the comers thereunto perfect or prepared and ready for God. Disheartening, wasn't it? And yet it was an unending process. Now, I think I've thrown it out before, and I find it hard to believe, but uh, I've read it in more than one, that Josephus made the claim that at the time of Christ, at the time of Christ, almost a million animals a year were sacrificed. Now, I find that hard to believe, because you divide a million by 365, and that's almost more than they could kill in a day. But whatever, we know it was a humongous amount of animals that were daily being sacrificed at the temple there in Jerusalem, and yet practically for nothing, because animals' blood couldn't do anything. All right, now let's move on to verse 2. For then, for then would they not have ceased to be offered? In other words, if those animal sacrifices were all that was necessary, wouldn't the day have come when they'd quit? <laughs> but they never could. They never could, because those sacrifices could not take away sin. All right, reading on in verse 2, because that the worshipers, once purged, should have had no more conscience of sin. In other words, if those animal sacrifices were complete in themselves, those Jews should have been able to go away from that temple. They should have been able to go back to their homes in Greece or Babylon, content that all of their sins were forgiven. But could they? No. No. Next year they had to be back again. See? All right. Then verse 3. But in those sacrifices there is remembrance made again of sins. How often? Every year. Now we're talking primarily about the Day of Atonement. And so Israel's sins were never removed. They just kept coming back and they kept coming back. It was unending. And this is what Paul is proving. And what a difference, as we're going to see the other side of the coin. Verse 4. This is why they had no assurance of sins forgiven, because it was not possible. Verse 4 now. It was not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sin. Wherefore, when he, speaking of the Messiah, the Christ, Jesus of Nazareth, Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body thou hast prepared for me. Now, we've got to stop a moment. What was he really saying? Did God take pleasure in all those innocent animals being slaughtered? No. No, he didn't take pleasure in it. Now, when they made a dent in Israel's spiritual life, I'm sure it made a difference. But most of the time, what was Israel's spiritual life? It was in the pits. Now let's go back to Isaiah 1. Let's go back. Isaiah chapter 1. Lest we get the mistaken idea that God was so pleased when those Jews would bring those perfect little lambs or those cute little goats and have them killed. He wasn't pleased with all that, but it was a part and parcel of his demand on the nation of Israel to let them show their obedience and, yes, their faith. If they did it right, they brought those sacrifices by faith. They did it the way God told them to do it. But most of the time, even faith was absent, see? So you come down to Isaiah chapter 1, verse 10. Now, this is God speaking through the prophet concerning all these sacrifices. Hear the word of the Lord, ye rulers of Sodom. Now, that's the other word for Jerusalem. Hear the word of the Lord, ye rulers of Sodom, or Jerusalem. Give ear unto the law of our God, ye people of Gomorrah. Now, why in the world call Jerusalem Sodom and Gomorrah? Because of their wickedness. Oh, hey, you, you have no idea. See? Now verse 11, to what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices? 
saith the Lord. I am full. I've had it, is the way we put it, don't we? I've had it up to here. Well, in God's own language, that's what he's saying. I am full of the burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts. I delight not in the blood of bullocks or lambs or he goats. When you come to appear before me, who hath required this at your hand to tread my courts? Bring no more vain oblations. Incense, which of course was part and parcel, you remember, of the sacrificial worship. Incense is an abomination unto me. The new moons and the Sabbaths. Now, do you know how meticulous the Jews were about all that? See, most people don't understand the customs. They were so intent on knowing the exact time that a new moon came about that they would actually station people on the mountains of Israel to watch the nighttime sky for the first slightest sliver of moon. And they could announce to the temple people, the new moon has begun. See? All right, this is what the Lord is talking about. They made such a big deal over the new moons, the Sabbath days, the calling of assemblies. God says, I cannot away with it. It is iniquity, even the solemn meeting. Now, whenever I read these verses, you know what I have to think of? I wonder how many services across the world today the Lord doesn't have the same feeling. Most of them. Oh, most of them have just become almost an abomination. So far have they departed from the truth of God's Word. And God hates it but they think that they can compensate for it with all of the entertainment and what have you, but I'm sure God doesn't. He doesn't swallow that. And he would like to just say, oh, way with it. Verse 15, when you spread forth your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Yea, when you make many prayers, I will not hear. Quite a condemnation, isn't it? Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Felding.